I just want to thank you all again for joining us tonight. My name is Kim Sutton and I'm the Chief Customer Officer at Powell City of Books in Portland, Oregon. Before we begin this evening, I just want to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events and visit our website, pals.com. You can also sign up there for our weekly events emails. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Casper Ter Kyle in conversation with Nadia Boltz Weber. This evening's event will include a Q&A at the end, so if you would like to ask a question, there's a button at the bottom of your screen. If someone has typed a question that you would like to know the answer to, you can upvote the question by clicking on the thumbs up um, icon. You can also support Casper and Powell's by purchasing a copy of The Power of Ritual, Turning Everyday Activities into Soulful Practices. A link to buy the book was included in your registration email and I will also share it in the chat a few times this evening. Tonight we are thrilled to welcome Casper Terkeil, a Harvard Divinity School Fellow and co-host of the popular Harry Potter and the Sacred Text podcast. His work has been featured in the New York Times, Boston Globe, Vice, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and on PBS. In The Power of Ritual, Terkeil invites us to deepen our ordinary everyday practices as intentional rituals that nurture connection and well-being. This call for ritual is ultimately a call to heal our loss of connection to ourselves, others, and our spiritual identities. This evening, Casper Tokyle is joined by Nadia Boltz Weber, ordained Lutheran pastor and founder of House for All Saints, for All Sinners and Saints in Denver, Colorado. Nadia is also the author of three best-selling memoirs, including Pastrix, The Cranky Beautiful Faith of a Sinner and Saint, she is also the host of the Confessional podcast, The Confessional with Nadia Boltz Weber, and that is hosted and produced by The Moth. Casper and Nadia, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having us. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks, Nadia, for, for saying yes to this conversation. Like, this is just fun for us to get to hang out and explore some big questions together. So I really appreciate it. I you know, being here. even if it's not over a three hour dinner. <laughs> <laughs> we'll just pretend the food is around us. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Nadia, we uh, we were just joking before we started the call that both of us in some way are too religious to fit into the secular world and too secular to fit into the religious world. And one of the things I was really excited to explore in this, this book, and I, I, I want to talk to you about, is the way in which we translate tradition mm -hmm so that it resonates in a world where religious institutions are, are increasingly less relevant, you know, more and more right. people are less and less religious in the US. And at yeah. the same time, so many of us who, who kind of sit outside a religious tradition are seeking and hungry and exploring and maybe right. dissatisfied by uh, just the, the kind of mix of trying this app with that nature hike and then hoping everything fits together. Um, right. So I, I, I want to start with, with that exploration of like, how, how do you think about how we can weave, weave tradition and modernity together? Yeah, well, it's something I do think about a lot, just in almost like anthropologically in the sense that yeah. human beings have always fashioned religion in some variety in every culture and time and place. And so to me, even though those things differ a lot, and that's not unimportant, I do think that religion meets a need in the human, in our psyche. Yeah. It meets a need for us psychologically, spiritually, socially, culturally. And so even if people aren't like religious per se, they aren't like attached to a religious institution right now, the need that religion has always met in the human still exists. And so I'm always curious, um, how are people, how are people getting those needs met? How are people attempting to get those needs met, yeah. but missing the mark, <laughs> you know? Um, and so that's why I've always liked your work so much. I mean, how we met was uh, you guys somehow sent me a copy of a study you did called How We Gather, which was, I think, it's sort of talking about where are millennials gathering and, and what do we learn about what needs are being met by, the, by studying where they're gathering. And 
I was still pastoring House for All Sinners and Saints and I got this in the mail and I immediately emailed you and said, you're brilliant. Like the conclusions that you were drawing, I thought were so spot on as somebody who started a church that drew a lot of not church people. Um, I knew that you were kind of onto something. Yeah, it, it, I mean, I remember, <laughs> I remember we made a list of like the 200 people that we most wanted to read this little study called How We Gather. Um, and, uh, and we were so excited about your work because it, it sits right in that sweet spot. And I think yeah. one of the things that, that the church community that you grew um, was so able to do, I mean, it had a huge, it still has a huge number of queer people who are part yeah. of the community. And, and one of the stories that I tell in the book is, you know, a moment when I was, you know, like a 15, 16 year old teenager, I was just in the process of coming out. And I, one of my kind of staying sane habits that I had um, was in boarding school. Every week I would go out and buy, you know, a large, a large amount of chocolate, uh, my favorite women's glamour magazine and an Agatha Christie novel. And I would always walk past this store, which had, you know, it was, I think it was called True Sounds or something. And it had like meditation cushions and lovely Danish throws. And I yeah. bought this like spa music. And I remember coming home and like just kind of massaging, not even my body, but just like, I was thinking it was like my aura, or my spirit or something as a 15 year old, <laughs> like with essential oils. Cause I was, tr I was trying to find something that would speak right. to that, as you describe it, like that religious sense of who I was. But as a non-religious person, I didn't, I didn't have access to it. Like I, di I didn't yeah. have rituals that I knew uh, to, to, to kind of tap into. And so it was always, it was always tinged with a little bit of danger, right? That sense mm -hmm. of like potentially being overwhelmed by this spiritual experience or spiritual longing. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I wonder like, how do you, when you're sitting down with someone who's just starting out on like a, a, a spiritual mm -hmm. exploration or, or starting to make space for these questions in a way maybe that they haven't before, mm -hmm. like what, what advice do you have as, as folks are taking those steps? I try to not sit down and have those conversations. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I um, like you're like I assume you just make yourself available. No, I really don't. No. <laughs> um, but <laughs> uh, but uh, I mean, I guess one of the things from my perspective as a as a ordained pastor and a public theologian is that I don't think that people have to intellectually assent to the same mm. theological propositions I happen to, to have access to rituals and, ah. uh, and to teaching or to benefit from the ritual and the teaching. So I think having the, the yeah. sort of uh, belief have to be attached to like rituals and teachings being efficacious, I don't, I reject that. I mean, and, and the, yeah, even in even in AA, I mean, they're like, oh, you, it doesn't just fake it till you make it. Like, it doesn't right. matter if you right now believe in God, hit your knees and do the prayer and thank something that is greater than you for keeping you sober this that day because your drunk ass could never do it by yourself. So something intervened. So and and right. there's this like right. thing of going through these rituals that creates can sometimes create yes. belief. Now it might not theologically match what the what the church is doling out, but there's something to be said for that. It, that's a, that was a huge inspiration for me because so many of the communities that we were looking at when we were at um, Harvard Divinity School kind of doing that research, the yeah. things that brought people together were not an invitation to a set, exactly what you said. It wasn't an invitation to like, come believe these things with us or even come be part of this community. It was like, come and practice these things together. Yeah. Um, right. So when, if you, I imagine right. walking down the street and you see a sign and it says, you know, come be part of our community or come believe this thing. Right. People are like walking around the sign. Right. But if it's like, come and sing songs with us or come make art or come be in silence or come dance, right. or come, that's when people were, or work out, right? So many of the different invitations. That's when yeah. people were really attracted. And then because the rituals are not just decorative, right? They're formative. That mm -hmm. They actually shape us in a way that we become mm -hmm. not just more coherent as a community, but, but we, it starts to shape our our worldview and, and even our kind of theological imagination. So they, they um, 
it, in, in some ways when I was thinking, like I didn't come up with the title, The Power of Ritual. Mm -hmm. It was one of those things where, where my publisher was like, we think this book is actually about ritual more than connection. I was like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. because but I the, the structure of the book is across like connecting with self, connecting with others, connecting with nature and then the oh, transcendent. Wow. And it's oh. the practices in each of those chapters that, that uh -huh. help you get reconnect oh, with, that, wow. with that sense of connection oh that's but really so I, interesting yeah i laughed huh. a lot but it's it, you're so huh. right that those rituals they shape us it's not it's, yeah. it's 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 not that we start by believing something and being like oh how should i express that with a ritual it's, yeah it's often starting with the experience of ritual and then that that helps us see the world differently yeah and i just think i just think it should just be free for everyone i mean i'm i'm just such a like religious socialist i think i did like i'm I basically describe it, my career as like, like creeping into cathedrals and absconding with the greatest treasures and putting them out <laughs> on the front lawn with the free sign. <laughs> just, well, I, no, man, just help yourself, you know? Do it, yeah, and, and that works, and that works well, I think, in a, in a, a culture like the US, which has such a, 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 a big Christian history, and, and yeah. you're especially reaching into the Christian tradition, yeah. Um, but it's 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 interesting how those things obviously change when we start talking about marginalized traditions or, or traditions that don't have the sure. same kind of cultural power. But I feel the same way with Christianity. I'm like, open, <laughs> open yeah. the doors and and discover the goodies. Yeah. <laughs> right. But but I think that that move has to meet, be made by somebody from the inside. Yeah. <laughs> like the, then it's appropriation. I mean, if you're sneaking into some, you know, to a place and absconding with the treasures and saying their mind that's a different thing yeah. that's when it gets tricky so maybe you're putting them out on the lawn and i'm coming to the lawn and then <laughs> discovering yeah, them and, exactly. and sharing them yeah. with the neighbors yeah help yourself take take some for anybody you know who might like that yeah right <laughs> so nadia one of the things that i feel like i've learned so much from you about is the practice of confession um, and it's, you know, the, the centerpiece of the podcast, which if folks haven't le learned or, or listened yet, check it out, The Confessional uh, with Nadia Boltz-Weber. And um, <clears throat> I, I write about the way in which I learned to think about prayer differently in the yeah. book, because for me, prayer was always like the worst of religion. I thought it was like the magical jukebox in the sky. And you yeah. kind of, you know, you put in your order and then expect something to happen. And for me, when I learned about the, it was the very kind of traditional Christian Kind of method of praying but the idea of acts right so uh, adoration contrition thanksgiving right. supplication these four stages yeah. that that you can move through and when i came to contrition or confession um it was a little uh it was first of all a little unsettling and mm. um it felt you know exposing and i was also very confused about like who am i confessing to uh, yeah. or, or what am what am I confessing to, especially if you're on your own, you know, in a kind of meditation or, or prayer? How how do you think about what that confession like? Does it need to be to someone else? Can it be well, silent? Hold on, I have questions. Yeah. <laughs> so when you when um so when you were sort of adding this into your practice, I, yeah. I get that you're like, who am I confessing to? All of that. Did you have a hard time accessing what it is you would confess? <laughs> Some days, yes. Some days, no. I mean, yeah. it's always, I always have my starting one, which was, I've been super selfish, because that's just totally. a constant state for me. Uh, <laughs> like, I totally. thought about, you know, I thought about what this would mean for me. I thought of what I could get out of it, right? Like, right. all of that is that's so right. strong in my head. Um, yeah. And then sometimes I'll have lots of, like, good examples of, like, oh, shit, like, you know, I just swore. Oh, there you go. Oh, here we are. Um, <laughs> but just that sense of, um, you know, I let this person down in this way, or right. Um, right. I, I didn't consider their needs, or you know, whatever right. it was. Or yeah. I, I impacted people in this way in which I, I, I didn't mean to, which was hurtful. Right. Um, so that that usually comes out, but it was more at first. I felt so absurd just kind of saying it out loud, or even saying mm -hmm. it in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, like mm -hmm. how how has that been shaped for you? Like who? Who does the confession happen to? Is it necessary to know? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I had a hard time with confession when I very first started coming back to church because I left Christian. I was raised fundamentalist, left Christianity right. for ten years, and then when I came back in the Lutheran tradition, 
they had that time where everyone stands up and says, you know, I've sinned against you and thought word and deed by what I've done and by what I've left undone. Yes. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved my neighbors myself, you know, all this stuff. And, and I just thought, what the hell is that? Like, it's like the church, <laughs> like, it felt like, yeah. it felt like a, uh, a brilliant sort of planned obsolescence that the, that that Christianity baked in, where you they they would make you feel so bad about yourself <laughs> that you would need the church to then confess. You know what I mean? It's like this it's a product market loop. fit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> brilliant. And you know where I need to show up here to confess to some thing I may or may not believe in about something I may or may not even think of as wrong, right? right. So I, I get that, right? But, the, but that left soon because just because of my experience in AA and the fact yeah. that we write a fourth and a fifth, we write a fourth step and we do a fifth step. So in that process, like if you, if you are so much of a garbage person that you cannot control your drinking and you're destroying yourself and everyone else like yeah. me, then, um, and and self-will isn't going to do it. You can't pull right. yourself up by your spiritual bootstraps. Then there's this program you enter. And one of the things you have to do is you have to write a, a, a searching and fearless moral inventory of yourself. Everybody you ever slept with, everyone you resent. You, I yeah. mean, all of this stuff you've done, you have to, you, then you have to look at, did, did it affect my self-esteem, my pocketbook? Like why? You have to really dig in. And yeah. then you have to say it all out loud in front of, another person and in the presence of a power greater than yourself. So I, I had already had the liberating experience yeah. of having gone through that. And so it felt instead of, instead of it confession, feeling like something I was, right. I was told I was supposed to do, but didn't really believe was true. It ended up being a, an opportune, a cleansing sort of uh, exercise that, resulted yeah. in freedom for me yeah. because the fact is is that um and maybe i have i have i have my conscience is just like more sensitive than other people but i'm constantly aware of what i'm not doing right the thing i wasn't honest about the way yeah. i hurt that person's feelings the yeah. way i'm not showing up in the way i should the fact that i definitely eat too much sugar i mean it doesn't it like it do, never stops you know and so, um, and then there are some super shitty things that I've done yeah. that I, they gnaw at me. And it's yeah. like, people, people really need freedom from the gnawing. The, the fact that this, something I did or said that hurt somebody or damaged myself or damaged a relationship, that it's haunting me. And <laughs> I, I want people to have freedom from that. Yeah. Do you find, because this has been my experience now, literally last night as I was falling to sleep, I was like, oh, that person from literally six years ago, I hadn't yeah. thought about that shitty thing that I'd done to them. Yeah. I need to, you know, and, totally. and for me, it's then a question of, okay, do I reach out to them? Or is that something yeah. that I'm, I just do right without right. necessarily involving them? Um, yeah. But the, the practice of confession, to, yeah. it, at least in my experience, you just keep right. seeing more of the ways in, in yeah, which no, I've totally. fallen short. And, yeah. and I think, you know, in our society, it's all about your polished Instagram version of yourself and uh, your accomplishments and your glories and victories. But um, I find all of that tedious and boring because uh, all I ever want to know when I meet, when I make a new friend is what's the worst thing they've ever done or what's a horrible thing they think and just try and not say. Then if somebody tells me that, it, it, I, an affection for them just grows in me in a yeah. way that knowing about their virtues, it would never happen. <laughs> right. No, a hundred percent. The other thing that I found really interesting was the way in which, for me, at least with confession, the way my body is postured can help oh. get get me into that place more easily. Yeah. And, and this was something I learned from a friend of mine who's, who's Muslim, Adina Lekovic, who, who helped... Uh, organize and create the, the Women's Mosque of America in LA. And, and she, uh, at one of the gatherings that we hosted at, at the Divinity School of, of all of these interesting new community leaders, she led us all in an experience of Muslim prayer. And just that, that the kind of getting on your knees and putting your head yes. onto the ground. Frustrating I had, yourself, yes. It, exactly. And I had just yeah. never even connected those two things. Right. But as right. soon as I did that, I just felt like, even though I wanted to not do it, out it came. You know yes. what I mean? 
Totally. Um, so just the, and yeah. I, I guess when I think of that, when I think of prostrating yourself, either just physically or emotionally through confession, yeah. it's not it's not to feel bad it's to stop feeling that's right bad. that's you right know? it's to get it's, it I, to get it out yeah i want people to stop feeling bad i want them to be free and so what happens when we're holding on to it is we're just mm -hmm. bound to it and i think that even if you don't believe in that there's like a god in the sky yeah. who's waiting for you to fess up so he'll dole out his stingy little forgivenesses but you have to prove yourself you know even if you don't believe in that um there to me to to, to go through the process of confession it just it, what it does is it aligns us back up with mm. a source of grace that's always available to us which i believe is is the source of our being, right? Like the mm. fact that we even get to be alive, you can't earn it. It's a grace, right? right? So right. there's some way in which I see grace as our source code. And to, to mm. and we have these mm. opportunities to just realign with the thing that's always there. It doesn't, hmm. so confession doesn't earn the forgiveness. It doesn't earn it. It just allows us to, to, to have a mm. posture where we can receive it. That's different. Oh, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I'm, I'm conscious we've got so many folks with us. I would love to hear in the chat just about folks, you know, what, what your confession practices look like or what your forgiveness practices look like. If you can share with us in the chat, I know that would be wonderful to read um, if you're comfortable sharing. That's always, uh, always fun. The, the other part of confession that often we don't really talk about is, is that part of absolution? Um, is, is that kind of receiving forgiveness? And, yeah. Can you talk about what, what that has traditionally looked like within right. the Christian or, or Lutheran yeah. liturgy? Like how how is yeah. how have traditions express right. that that giving so, of, of or receiving of absolution? So in our in my tradition we have a right of corporate confession and absolution. So that's done mm. uh, when people gather. And then, and the absolution that I use most frequently at House for All Sinners and Saints after the confession is I would say God, who is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, loves you as you are. Mm -hmm. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins in the name of the triumph of God. So that's what it was in wow. corporate worship. And I realized like, my yoga teacher never says that shit to me. <laughs> you know what I mean, I mean right. for as much as I love that, that practice as well. There's something yeah. that may, I need to be reminded you're forgiven. It's a yeah. powerful thing. Even if you can't articulate your theology of it, just hearing like you're forgiven, you're forgiven, you're forgiven. It makes all You know, the I have to hear it all the time. I yeah. have to hear it all the time. And then in individual confession and absolution, there's this lovely part of this, of this liturgy of individual confession and absolution where the priest or the pastor says to the person after they've confessed and before they declare absolution, they say, do you believe, do you believe that the word of forgiveness I am about to say to you comes from God? Yeah. And then I have to say yes. Yes. And then you say, and then you do it. So it's saying, Woo, that I'm gives not, me chills. yes, I'm not giving this to you. I, this is uh, something that I'm just uh, proclaiming to already be true and reminding you of. It's lovely. That's so beautiful because it also yeah. confronts the harsh reality, which is like, it's not, it's, it's not that you have to convince me. I have to convince myself that Correct. like, that I'm Correct. deserving of it and that it is, yeah. you know, forgivable because totally. we're so much harsher on ourselves than than other people of us are right, and certainly right. and however the divine would be thinking of us and it was but my parishioners would avail themselves of private confession and absolution more than i think in traditional lutheran churches and yeah. it was the biggest honor you know to hear people's hmm. confessions but honestly casper a lot of times it was boring. Yeah, it's I mean, really not that exciting. <laughs> no, like they would be so like tense and stuff and then they'd be out with it and I was still waiting to hear the confession. Like I was like, shit, like not like, you know, this is no all offense thought. meant, but yeah. like, I'm really unimpressed by your sin. You know, if forgiveness is available for all of us at all times, maybe you should go make more use of it. <laughs> Just try, you should try harder. 
So I love that. But yeah. it, but it, this also speaks to something that I mean, I first started seeing it. Remember Post Secret that website? Yes, 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 like, yes. Perfect. Just that we have this need. Yeah. And of course it's everywhere on, online because we have anonymity, but just that, yeah. you know, whether, whether it's, I don't know where else you could see. It. I mean, obviously on, on like Reddit threads or on, mm -hmm. you know, just, just mm -hmm. places where people are, are, are sharing stories that otherwise might be, you know, seen as embarrassing or, or, right. or wrong, but that, right. that we need, we have this urge to, 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 to share those stories. Um, right. In part, I think because we we hope that other people like yeah me too like you know you're, correct you're not, you're not the right. only one um, but also because I think we're looking for that experience of forgiveness of someone to say you know yeah. it's okay um, totally yeah. and it doesn't define that does not get to tell you who you are like everybody mm. Brian Stevenson talks about mm. we none yes. of us are only the worst thing we've ever done we're so much more than that you know yeah. Yeah, I was just listening to this conversation with uh, Ezra Klein this week. It definitely, if folks haven't haven't listened to that conversation, it was amazing. Um, yeah, I don't, oh, so I good. don't. I've met a lot of sort of, I guess, famous people, and I don't get terribly worked up. Like there aren't many people I would ever like fawn or like fawn over or fangirl over. I definitely embarrassed myself He's, in front of Brian Stevens. Oh, you did. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you do? We, we, well, because we have the same Swedish publisher and we were at a book fair in Sweden together and we were the two Americans and I, I was like bumbling. I, I, the Swedes were looking at me like, what, ha what happened to Nadia? Like I was trying to talk to him and explain who I, and we had just been together at an event five days before in Nantucket, but I didn't get to say hi to him. Anyway, I'm, I, I don't know. I'll, I I hope I never see him again because it was really humiliating. So. <laughs> oh my God! Well, one day I'm sure he'll 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 come to you and have the same experience. <laughs> he has no idea who I am, Catherine. <laughs> he will. Seriously. He will. No. He's gonna listen. He's gonna listen <laughs> no. to the confessional. He's gonna get it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But it's, yeah, I mean, it, uh, there's all sorts of interesting parallels we could make with the, the justice system and where forgiveness and absolution and mm. our kind of civic judicial system sit. But sure. we'll leave that for another day. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just want to remind everyone, please, please feel free to add your questions um, in the Q&A. We'll be, we'll be looking forward to, to answering, or at least, I can't remember where I heard this, but someone recently said, I don't do Q&As, I do Q&Os. Because That's I can me. give you questions and opinions. Was that from you, Nadia? That was me. Yeah, yeah. I, d I have. I don't have any answers, but I have a lot of opinions. So that I feels more opinions. honest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll say well, we've we've got Q and O time. So please please add your questions. But the the other thing I wanted to talk to you about was you know, I, I really tried to write the book with the the starting with an affirming of what people are already doing in their lives, whether they think sure, of it as yeah. spiritual or ritual, um, yeah. but, the, but the natural inclinations that we have to make meaning and to, to find relationships yes. that are oriented around depth and, and, and connect to something bigger than ourselves. So to start with a kind of an affirming uh, voice mm -hmm. and then to invite people into tradition by saying like, well, if you're interested in this, have you heard about, you know, Abraham right. Joshua Heschel or this practice right. from Aquinas or this Ignatian way of engaging with text. You might also wonder, like. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Netflix suggests. Uh, yeah. Um, but when you think about, because you spend a lot of your time kind of talking into the secular world, how, yeah. how do you think mm -hmm. about kind of inviting people into the thing that their hearts already long for in mm -hmm. a way that is not about introducing a whole new way of thinking about the world, but really deepens the things that are already most meaningful to people. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that is, that's a very sort of pastoral move is to mm. sort of help people see what's already in their lives as sacred or, you right. know, just reframing things for folks or yeah. to say, you know, if they say, I have this quirk that I always end up reacting to this stimulus in this way in my life to instead of that being like some sort of horrible flaw to say that's a form of intelligence that you learned yeah. when you were young because that's how you survive some sometimes just switching it like that um, can be a really yeah. pastoral move yeah 
I thought I might, I don't want to read too much, but I thought I'd read no, just I, the beginning. I'd, I'd love for you to, yeah. Just, just the beginning of the book, because it, it really speaks to this um, invitation, I hope. So this is the, the kind of opening, uh, opening page or two from, uh, from the power ritual. As a teenager, I was convinced You've Got Mail was the greatest movie of all time. <laughs> Kathleen Kelly and Joe Fox, played by Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks, meet online in the early days of AOL chat rooms. We're in 1998 here. Think Monica's The Boy Is Mine and Bill Clinton's Sex Scandal. Hmm. All they know about each other is that they love books and they love New York City. Nothing else. Not even one another's real name. And through the back and forth emails that they send each other, they fall in love. They're honest with each other about their secret fears and hopes and pain. Mm. They share everything that they don't even tell their partners. This mm. is the best of online anonymity, feeling intimately connected and totally safe at the same time. And connected and safe were two things I didn't feel at all. I was a gay kid living in an English boarding school with 50 testosterone fueled teenage boys. Mm. I stuck out like a sore thumb. A look around my bedroom, shared with three others, revealed all you needed to know. As you walked in, there were posters of half-naked supermodels and racing cars to the right, pictures of the band Slipknot in their horror masks on the left, and then in my corner, a complete collection of Agatha Christie books and glitter gel pens. <laughs> <laughs> true story. True story. <laughs> Needless to say, I wasn't the first boy chosen for the rugby team or the soccer team, or anything really. I did join the aerobics class for girls, breaking boundaries for all future queer kids in the school, I hope, but that's another <laughs> story. <laughs> I felt lonely all the time. I would go on walks and pretend I was a hairdresser, asking myself out loud about any vacations I was going on. I tried to ingratiate myself with the older boys by making them toasted Nutella sandwiches, like a baboon trying to demonstrate submission on the savannah. Please don't hurt me, I will bring you food. So <laughs> you can imagine why a movie about love and connection and joy meant so much to me. Mm -hmm. And it's important to say that, spoiler ahead, the two characters in You've Got Mail don't actually meet until the final, my least favorite scene. Mm -hmm. The movie is about the promise of love and connection mm -hmm. more than the actual experience of it, because I longed for that kind of connection. And a tiny, mm -hmm. tiny part of me trusted the universe enough that, that perhaps one day, Ideally, in glamorous Manhattan, I might find my own version of a literary multimillionaire who had a dog called Brinkley. <laughs> I've rewatched You've Got Mail many, many times, but it represents so much more to me now than just a movie because I've made it more meaningful. I have very specific rituals for when and how to watch, always alone, always with a tub of pralines and cream, Hagen dazs ice cream. <laughs> It's not an, oh, what shall we watch kind of movie. It's an, mm -hmm. I'm feeling lost and alone and I need everything I've got to bring me out of this slump kind of movie. <laughs> Certain lines are inscribed on my heart like mantras. Characters are totems of what I want to be and not be in the world. Well, for most people, it's just another rom-com. For me, You've Got Mail is sacred. And that's what this book is all about taking things we do every day and layering meaning and ritual onto them, even experiences as ordinary as reading or eating by thinking of them as spiritual practices. I love that. I'm going to totally watch. I am going to watch it tonight. I swear to God, I'm watching that movie tonight. It's so good. Oh God, I love it so much. <clears throat> right, uh, let's get to some questions. We've got beautiful ones coming in here. Um, let's go to Becky's question. Um, how do you handle or respond to critique and questions and criticism from folks who are strongly within the tradition <laughs> and less open to these kinds of practices? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of folks who consider themselves gatekeepers. Is there a way mm -hmm. to invite them into these practices so that they can hear? That I, they're not my audience, so I don't really, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like when people, yeah. uh, I love that question, but for myself when people critique my work like i wrote a book called shameless about sex and christianity and whatnot and people were you know very priggishly clutching their pearls about <laughs> you know all of this and i'm i was unbothered because i didn't write it for them they already have what they need the christian publishing world is their oyster do you know it's what I, there, yeah. there is 
They, they will never lack for books to help them double down on what they already believe, right? Yeah. So yeah. they're taken care of. And so I, I always think of a, I, always, I have a discernment question I ask myself almost every day. Mm -hmm. My friend Suzanne Stabile, who's an Enneagram teacher, taught me. Yes. What's, Love that. Yes. What's mine to do? And what's not mine to do? But then also, and this is a little harder, what's mine to care about? And what's Ooh. not mine to care about? Now, Ooh. that doesn't mean it's not worthy to be cared about by someone, but that's not mine to care about because I think, right, you know, we only have so much emotional bandwidth in our lives. And so, um, like, what people, an audience that I did not write something for, what their opinion of it is, is not really mine to even care about. So oh my God, they're yeah. fine. People who are ensconced in their tradition and they're traditionalists and they're gatekeepers, they're gonna be fine. Uh, the, I am not, I'm not for them. And right. they have plenty right. of people who are for them. So to and me, I don't need I'm, to, I'm bothered. Exactly, and I don't need to tear them down, but it, and that's yep. not what I'm trying to do, but, but yeah. I'm intentionally trying to serve a, a different group of people, yeah. Right, that's yeah. right. Yeah. And that when people get really pearl clutchy about my colorful language and I'm like, you're, just move on. Nothing to see here. You have, yeah. there's so much available for you. There, there aren't a lot of people who are speaking theologically and saying fuck at the same time. Like that's, there's a certain audience for whom that is that we love it because that's yeah. just how I actually speak. And a lot of my friends do. And so they shouldn't, I mean, it doesn't matter if it's not for them. Yeah. There's plenty that is, you know? Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. There's, there's a question here from Rachel that um, uh, someone else who's anonymous also talked about just in terms of the impacts of COVID. Um, and I'm, I'm curious to think about rituals and sacred practices that have been maybe especially important for you over these last, at this point, five months. Um, and, and how you're thinking about ritual life generally and, and the implications of the pandemic. Well, um, I'm very, I'm a very sacramental Christian and so, I really want the stuff and the bodies and the, you know, mm -hmm. I want the physical things. Mm -hmm. So it's been devastating to not have Eucharist, to not yeah. break hunks of actual bread with people and, and to not sing, you know, I mean, That's House my big one too. Oh my God, yeah. House for All Sinners and Saints is totally a cappella, and they sing in four part harmony. It's like sitting in the middle of a choir mm -hmm. and all of the music you heard every single note of it came out of the bodies of the people who showed up mm -hmm. and you can't sing harmony by yourself. Like it's so beautiful that you can create this thing. And I know you have such a love for singing as well. And yeah. um, so there are these things that have been, that have felt devastating to me. And it's made me rethink my snotty opinions about some stuff because mm. my parents are not part of a liturgical sort of sacramental church and their church had a prayer and praise service in the parking lot a few weeks ago. And yes. I went to, I wanted to be able to see them from a distance, but support their pastor, who's a black preacher in a largely white church. And I'd been messaging yeah. him. It was at, when a lot of the protests were happening. So I went and they, when you drove in, you got the Lunchables communion, you know? Yes. <laughs> it's like yes. the little wafer on top yeah. of a hermetically sealed little shot thing of grape juice yeah. and everyone has their individual. I mean, I could make fun of that shit for hours, <laughs> hours. I would never get tired of making fun of this. Uh, uh, and, and yet I had not experienced you. And it's not even liturgical. They aren't saying the same prayers. They aren't doing the whole liturgy, but here was this little pasty yeah. little cracker and a, plastic thing of grape juice and to just hear somebody talk about the night Jesus was betrayed <laughs> and mm -hmm. to talk about we do this in remembrance and for forgiveness of sins and I I found it meaningful I found it yeah. comforting it was a comfort and it was so fucking far from what I would prefer traditionally and so yeah, yeah. that's uh, it's so interesting because I feel like with working with some Jewish colleagues recently, thinking about ways in which spirituality and tradition can be expressed. Food has been one of the things that I think is, it, there's a huge opportunity to, to really focus on 
the, the ways in which spiritual traditions can live in our homes, um, even, even if congregations are that, you know, the scale that, that folks might be used to struggle um, and thinking about cooking particular family recipes or, um, you know, finding, or, you know, starting to say blessings over food before they're shared. Um, mm -hmm. Just the way in which those, yeah, those, those, those material elements that we can share safely now become all the more important. Um, the other thing that I will say is like, I'm noticing people are willing to risk more when stuff is online because you're mm -hmm. like the worst thing that happens is you just log off, but like it, mm -hmm. you don't have to travel somewhere or go into a building that you don't know or necessarily be with people that you're a little worried about. Um, mm -hmm. And so there's, the, uh, my sense is that there's some, some real opportunity for kind of risk taking and ritual making in, in some interesting new ways. Um, yeah. And I think for me, I mean, I've gone to a few church services online, not, not many, but <clears throat> there's always something I find moving about it, you know, yeah. and, and surprisingly so sometimes, and, and that's yeah. enough, you know, maybe that's yeah. enough. So, yeah. yeah. Beautiful questions coming in. Thank you everyone for, for asking them. If you can use the Q and A feature that helps me keep track of them and, and put, you can also upvote other people's questions, which is happening here. Um, another anonymous question over here, um, with the idea oh of self-created rituals, how do you both manage to find meaning in them without a text or something that feels important about them? It can feel empty and performative, especially in the era of self-care. And I, like, I'm really juiced up about this one because I think it, one, of the, one of the things I try and do in the book as well is to, you know, although I, I really want us to start with the things that we're already doing, the things, the habits, the, the loves, the longings we already feel. I yeah. really try and connect them to practices mm. that have a history and that have theological sure. depth because, right. and, and some of the questions that I've gotten from more secular places like, okay, so how do I design a ritual? And I'm like, okay, like I have an answer for that, but I'm more interested in how does this echo something that religious communities have been doing forever? And what can we learn about those to shape and inform this particular right. practice. Right. Because right. I, I think there is something missing if you're creating it out of nothing. At, at least there's a history, if nothing else. I mean, every tradition starts as an innovation. So I like I get that. But there is for me, I'm always really excited when there's that layer of history that, that comes Yeah, in. I mean, but, look, if if I thought, you know, I've never baked anything in my life, I have no clue how it's baked, but I really want to make bread. I'm going to look yeah. randomly at shit in my cupboards <laughs> and do you know what I mean? And like, Little just bit of on this. my own wisdom, yeah. I'm going to put stuff together because I'm pretty sure this is how you do it. And, and yet there's a lot of recipes. People have been making bread for a long time. A they long understand time. leavening. There's, you know, there's certain practices that have been proven, you know? Yeah. So a recipe is not the worst thing in the world, you know? <laughs> I love that. I love I, that. I have a question actually for you uh, yeah. related to the confession thing is that, so I have what's called a low theological anthropology. So what yeah. that means is I have a low opinion of human beings, myself and everyone else. So yeah. um, I just constantly see all the ways that we're kind of acting selfishly and, and pawning it off as virtue or whatever, you know, I mean, we do it in so many yeah, ways. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it's a, I talk about sin a lot, it, which being yeah. a liberal who talks about sin is not the easiest thing because people just think the church is about making you feel bad. But I'm like, yeah. but just stay with me for a minute. You are kind of bad. It's fine. <laughs> it's okay. Because, because you are kind of good too. Like you're, you're yeah. both things, but, you know, so but it can be a hard sell. So my question yeah. is this, in, in the, when you're talking to people who are wanting yeah. to maybe tap into some stuff, create some ritual, but not be part of an organized religion, does it, it tend to often be the feel good stuff and not the harder self-examination stuff? Because I'm like, look, when people say they're spiritual I, and not yeah. religious, what I, what I think it means is that they've curated a set of practices and beliefs that give them a sense of well-being. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, that's a beautiful thing to do. But I think 
if it if it does not afflict the comfortable and comfort, and the, comfort afflicted, the afflicted it yeah. will it will might give you a sense of well-being i doubt it will transform you the transformation comes from the uncomfortable yeah. shit you're not going to pick up you're not going to pick up in a you know buffet line a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And and this speaks so much to my experience, Nadia, because yeah. I started out, oh, I'll try this meditation. Like, oh, sure. I'm going to try this retreat. And of and course. I'm so glad I did. I'm so glad I did. And it, and it definitely helped. The thing for me that changed everything was when I had a mentor who sat me down and said, I'm going to be your mentor because you're never going to ask for help. Like someone had to kind of like, <laughs> break and she was right like i was i was feeling great you know about myself yeah. and so i like the way i think about it is like you need someone who loves you enough and tells you the truth mm -hmm. who can kind of break through mm -hmm. that honestly fragile uh, well-being yeah. kind of yes. building that we build around us yeah. um, and so mm -hmm. the thing that and i try and do this in the book as well is to be like listen <laughs> if all you think that rituals are for is to help you feel better. It's, it's, in, it's insufficient. It's First insufficient. of all, they can't, it's, it's not that it's bad, but there's right. so much right. more. And you, right. I want right. you to have access to it and learn right. about it and discover right. the joys yeah. and, the, and the, the freedom, as you said. Right. Um, and so, first of all, you can't do them alone. I think it's not mm -hmm. only limiting, I think it's dangerous because often you end up either believing that you're the greatest there is or the worst there is, and both are not true. Um, and also that, that literally there are people who can help and who, who you know, whether it's a spiritual director, whether it's, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, an elder or a mentor who, yeah. who, is, who wants to walk alongside you um, yeah. to kind of break through, to puncture that a little bit. So, yeah. but, but again, <laughs> this is where I get frustrated with religious institutions because I'm like, yeah. I wish, that was just a great list, a spreadsheet, a, a match.com, so that folks could could connect with someone who yeah. they would recognize as trustworthy. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's maybe the, the biggest barrier is that still there's so much um, rightly earned uh, hesitation around engaging or just not knowing, hey, is this ordained person going to be affirming right. of my identity it, it will i you know will i be shamed or made to do xyz you know that right. i don't that i don't agree with and that's just not within yeah. christianity that's that's everywhere um, yeah that's right so those those are the moments where i don't i, I honestly i don't really blame people who are right. who are stuck in the well-being thing because it's all that they're hearing it's all that they're being offered you know what i mean yeah hey i want to get to some of these real quick uh, it says answer live um yes do it. Okay. Wondering what thoughts you each have about Ooh. social protests as ritual. Yes. It's been really fascinating to me. I mean, the Black Lives Matter movement claims itself as a spiritual movement. Yes. And that is not talked about in kind of the, the press that I read. Um, I mean, the, the founders of that movement integrate Ifa practices. Mm -hmm. You see altar building, you see right. singing, you see uh, right. a, a deeply like somatically informed practices of healing yes. together with yes. justice practices. Right. I singing. think this is singing. I think uh, physical like massage, um, right. like um, medicine using all sorts of, you know, herbal remedies and traditional. It's amazing. I think it, it's one of the most alive expressions of like grounded spirituality there mm. is today. And it, it, yep. it, it, it's, in, I mean, I'm not an expert on the right. black church, but it is also really interesting to see how the generational differences kind of generally in, in American mm -hmm. culture are also playing out in, in the kind of the religious differences yeah. Um, yeah. between the kind of institutional black church and younger movement leaders in the Black Lives Matter yeah. movement. So yeah. I, I definitely too. see them yeah. as, as expressions of, of spiritual and full of ritual, right. spir spiritual life. Yeah. How about you? Yeah, no, I agree totally with what you said. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I'm trying to, it's hard to read these, but, uh, Okay, here's one. Casper, one of the aspects of ritual you mentioned in your book is consistency. I don't have Ooh, my book with yes. me, so sorry if this is the wrong language. But I am in a place in my life where my work and school schedule and the demands of my, on my time are very sporadic. Yeah. I'm very compelled by rituals like Sabbath or exercising intentionally, but um, 
consistency is unattainable. Do you have advice for integrating ritual if I have trouble with consistency? Well, I feel you is the first thing that I want to say. Um, one thing, Alyssa, that I might offer is that usually when we think about consistency or repetition, as I talk about in the book, we see it as like a daily thing. And that is amazing if you can do it. Sure. But for me, it's been really important to have, honestly, my most important practices are weekly. So I have yeah. the, the tech Sabbath that I do on Friday nights. And then I have my covenant with my two mm -hmm. colleagues where we read aloud the covenant that we have together. And then we talk about mm -hmm. where we've fallen short and where we've lived into it. That happens in our Monday oh. team meeting. Um, and so mm -hmm. it's, oh my God, it's the best. <laughs> it's the best. Mm -hmm. um, so honestly, for, for me, having those mm -hmm. weekly ones feel much more sure. doable. Yeah. And even then it doesn't happen every week, right? Sometimes yeah. I'm traveling, like this week I'll, 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 I'll be traveling. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just doesn't, it doesn't always happen. And for me, it's about, yeah. it's never about perfection, but it's about returning to the intention or returning to the practice as best we can. Um, and this is another reason for me why I try not to do them on my own, because then like Nadia, you were saying before, if it's only up to my will and my sure. like being good enough, then I'm going to fail all the freaking yeah. time. Um, totally. But, but I'm curious, what, what would you add in terms of, trying to find <clears throat> consistency also i don't have kids like i, I you yeah. know my just the circumstances of my life are so different mm -hmm. i've had periods of my life where i had very dis disciplined spiritual practices on a daily basis um yeah. and and i was grateful for that and it's what i needed at the time but i realized maybe a couple of weeks ago it, it feels like there's two different kinds of broadly speaking sp people um, in terms of spiritual disciplines. I'm yeah. like a hunter gatherer and other people are agriculturalists. <laughs> and so yes. the agriculturalists, they have the rose, they plant the seed, they go, yeah. they plant another seed. There's this, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's very yeah. prescribed and it's systematic and they know the harvest, right? And, and those, and I always judged myself when I'm not in a period of doing that for not being yeah. an, a farmer, but I'm more of a hunter gatherer where my spiritual practice, I think is about always about paying attention and mm. more than anything in the sense mm. that I can have an interaction and I will see it in a certain way because I'm paying attention later. I'll reflect mm. on it. I'll see mm. patterns in my life. I'll, I, I'm mm. like just kind of stupidly stumbling around and I'm like, Oh my God, there's some berries. Thank God. Uh, you know? So, <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's more the practice yes. for me is is in is in paying attention and seeing oh my god there's so many places to find spiritual sustenance but i'm yes. not the one creating them through my practice right now i've had times when that was the truth but right now right now it's different yeah i love that especially because it makes space for those little moments, you know, whether, whether you're walking to the grocery store and you suddenly look up at the sky or, uh, right, like that, yeah. that, that you can just, that, that, that we can call that a spiritual practice. I love that, like the discipline yes. of noticing, because they're gonna happen, like can we be open enough to receive them when they come? Right, yeah. it's a, it, is a, it is a thing about presence. And you know, a lot of times I'm in my head, I'm just constantly yeah. thinking about other stuff to where I'm like, how did I get from my apartment to the store? I remember I was not present to the drive at all, you know? And so um, for myself, when I, when I can have that presence, just stop, take a breath, check in, drop in, then yeah. um, I realize, oh, there's sustenance here, you know? Yeah. The, the final thing I'll say, this has been, I don't even wanna say it's like a tip, but something that, that, that feels like it's been helpful for me is to try and build on those intentional moments, like the more the more agricultural approach, mm -hmm. onto onto things that I'm already doing. So, like yeah. whether it's you know putting moisturizer on my face is when I do right. my little kind of memento mori, or when right. I'm in the shower I have to do stretches because I broke my ankles. So that's a moment where right. I can intentionally think about you know. So it's kind of like layer laying on top, layering <clears throat> on top of something that you already do rather than mm -hmm. having to see it as a whole like new category of right. to-do lists at which right. we again are going to fall short. Yeah, um, I publish, I, I, most Sundays I publish prayers and, um, I was going to say you I, have writing as a spiritual practice. I mean, that's so, such a huge, at least the yeah, way I receive them. 
totally. <laughs> I think that's true. Yeah. But um, most Sundays, if um, I do publish prayers, if I feel them, I write them, I put them up. If I don't, I let myself off the hook, you know. Yeah. But um, a couple months ago, during the pandemic, I wrote prayers that were like, it looks like we're not going to get to go to church for a while. And yeah. so <laughs> when when my eyes brighten in a smile behind my mask at a cashier may that count as as passing the peace when i sit mm. for one more homemade meal with my cloth napkins may it be counted as eucharist you know like yeah. i yeah. that um i wrote a bunch of those that that were sort of along along that line yeah mm. Mm. friends we're, we're coming to the top of the hour and i, I want to make sure we respect all of your time so <laughs> Um, I want to invite, <laughs> Nadia, I didn't tell you this, but I'm going to ask you if you're willing, if you might okay. give us all a blessing as we oh, finish yeah. our time together. <laughs> um, so I'll give you a minute to, <laughs> to think mm -hmm. about that. Oh. Like just remind everyone, check out the confessional Nadia's podcast. Um, if you would like to buy a copy of the book, I'd be so grateful. Uh, and of course, please buy them at Powell's, um, especially <laughs> for those of you uh, uh, who are local. Um, and uh, we'll hand over to Kim again in just a minute. But I so appreciate you all being here and just oh, being interested in these questions and, and exploring mm. them with us. I, it, mm. it, it makes me very happy to know that uh, oh. at least I'm not alone, uh, even from all the way over here. So, <laughs> well, Nadia, it's one I'll of those. It's, the blessing thing is is another one of like, where do you receive a blessing if you don't have a priest? Yes. Where do you receive a blessing? I'm like, have we? It, Instagram likes is that what we're trying to get a blessing on our life like yeah. I'm gonna post a picture of myself and if you if do you know what I mean it, yeah and because we do we need to receive a blessing somewhere and yeah. that's 100%. why at the end of the confessional I write blessings for my guests and give them so that is why so I think the blessing that I would I would offer um, people is one of of place in the sense of mm. <clears throat> may you know during this time when we are stuck in one place more than we are used to being stuck in one place may the place that we are stuck feel more expansive than we ever thought it could may the fact that we are seeing other people on these little screens all day be seen and experienced as community in a way that we never ever thought that they could May the place that we find ourselves in be a safe place. May it find little corners of sacredness um, where all we thought was there was the armchair our father uh, gave us. <laughs> uh, so may the place that we are stuck be a place mm. that feels like home in a whole new way because out there and in here has been folded together in a way we never thought it would. Mm, may it be so. Yeah. Thank you so much, Nadia. Yeah, pleasure always. May it be over a three three hour dinner next. Yes. Time. <laughs> uh, All right. So so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event. It was really a pleasure to host both of you. Um, you can purchase a copy of the Power of Ritual by visiting pals.com. <laughs> be sure to check out our upcoming events, and we look forward to seeing you again soon at another virtual event. Thank you so much with our gratitude. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Kim, for organizing. <laughs>